Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you. As you remain standing, please turn to 353 as we sing Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. We'd ask our deacons and ministers to come forward at this time. And you as well, if you have a particular need or prayer request, you'd like for them to join you in prayer as we sing. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Father, we thank you so much for the good day you've given us. We thank you for all your blessings that we receive every day. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your love, for your faithfulness, for your grace to save us and to sustain us. And Father, as we worship together today, I pray that we'd please you in all that we'd do, that we'd bring you glory, that we'd lift up Jesus. And Father, in His name, we bring these burdens to You. You know the need of every person. You know those who are sick, those who are facing surgery, uh, those who have tests, uh, those, Father, who need wisdom, uh, who need uh, help with decisions, who need uh, financial help, uh, who need spiritual help, uh, who need encouragement. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, You just meet all of these needs. And Father, don't let anything hinder our worship to get to, uh, today, that we lift up Jesus and that uh, anyone today without Him as Savior would come to Him today, that they'd turn from their life and their sins and turn to Christ for salvation. We pray, Father, that we would please You in the work we do, that we would uh, be the church, that we'd be in our community, in our culture, making a difference with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that as you meet these needs today, that we give you thanks and that our faith grows stronger and we trust you with all of our hearts because you love us, you're faithful, you have a plan for our lives. Thank you, Father, for all of these things and please bless our worship together today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Number 264 as we continue singing. Oh, glad to have everyone with us today as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's all about the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
second verse for my pardon this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my queen nothing but the blood of oh let's sing that third verse here we go There's power in the blood, right? Would you be free from your burden of sin? Say it. There's power in the Course again on the course of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Listen now as the choir sings.
to glory Linger near the eastern gate For I'm coming in the morning So you'll not have long to Somewhere beyond the grave There is a land Where Jesus went to prepare By his own hand And for the saved by grace There is a resting place and in a few more days it will be mine some call it heaven i call it home some call it dreaming let me dream on Somewhere beyond the skies Some call it heaven I call it home Someone said you can't go Back home again And things will not ever be as good as they've been but friend I've got good news for you when heaven comes into view 
One glimpse and you'll know the best It's yet to come Some I'll in heaven I call it home Some call it dreaming Let me dream on
if we could have our ushers now at this time. We'll take up our morning offering. And we do have junior church for ages 4 through 11. Junior church for ages 4 through 11. Just out the back doors, there'll be someone to help you to your class. All right. Boy, we've got a good group going this morning. It's wonderful. See all of our youth in our morning service. All right. Otis and Lynn, I know you got some guests with you. Uh, Otis got his sister and husband with him today. Thank you for visiting with us. Still in Michigan, right? All right. Glad to have you all with us. Who's, all right. Brother Mike's going to come and ask God's blessing on our God bless you all. Lost a lot of good people again this week, it seems like to me. Uh, lose one or two every week. But uh, Sam and Rita Kay and Jerry Fugit, all people have known all my life. It doesn't get any easier. It just keeps happening, but we just got to go on. So keep those families in your prayers and, and uh, keep them in your thoughts. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for another great day on this earth, beautiful day out there. Lord, watch over our, our military. Right now is a real disgusting time. It's a little scary. Uh, watch over the people who went through the tragedy of these hurricanes. Make the day just a little bit better for them. I know they've had some bad days. But thank you most of all for Jesus. Without him, we'd just be so, so lost. Nowhere to go. Take this offering. Bless it toward your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is not another sister, friend, or brother Loves the way that Jesus can He proved his love for me When he died on Calvary He gave his life for fallen man His love, his love is a boundless love and it reaches down and touches me. Touches me. His love, His love is a boundless love that will last through all eternity. Jesus wants to love you. There is none above you. You are precious in His sight. He will never fail you. When the doubts assail you, he'll be with you day and night. His love, His love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. Touches me. His, love, His love is an endless love that will last through all eternity. Love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. Touches me. His love, His love is an endless love that will last through all eternity. His love, His love, His love, His love, His love. His love. His love. Amen. His love is incredible, isn't it? Amen. Where would we be without God's love? His amazing, incredible, boundless love. Now please turn with me to Romans chapter 3. There are four things that people don't like to talk about. 
not even on uh, Facebook. <laughs> you don't see these things discussed very much, and there you'll see anything and everything. Uh, but these are four things, and I'm going to talk about one of them today. The other three I don't want to talk about. <laughs> I talk about them when, when we can, when I want to. How's that? All right. Look at one of them today. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. Everybody. Everyone. Every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Father, we thank you for this day. Your blessings, your word. And Father, as we study together, I pray that every word spoken is yours and not mine, and that your will is done in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, let's talk about sin. Now, people don't like to talk about sin uh, because it puts us in the position of being guilty. Uh, we feel bad about ourselves. And in our society, we're taught that we don't want to feel bad about ourselves. Even though, if someone would tell you about sin, and you would feel bad about yourself, you might do something so that you could get rid of the problem and feel good about yourself. It's like when we, uh, we get physically sick, we want to go to the doctor and find out what's wrong and then do something so that we can be well, right? right? The costs of medical care and prescription drugs and all that is overwhelming in our world because when we feel bad, we want to get well, and we do what we need to do to get well. But it's not the case with sin. We don't want anybody telling us we have a problem. There's something wrong. You're sick. You need help. We get mad. We get offended. How dare you say that I've done anything wrong? It's like we, want, we don't want to hurt anybody's self-esteem. We want you to feel good about yourself. And yet we withhold the truth from them. And, and we can't do anything to get help if we don't know the truth. If we don't admit the truth. And the fact is, everyone has sinned. Amen. And so let's study this a little bit today to find out what this is all about. And since we're all sinners, then we're all on the same level. So nobody here today is like you're better than anybody else. You're not better than anybody else. We're always talking about uh, back there, I don't know, maybe as Betty and I were talking before Sunday school, we were saying, you know, we're all just sinners saved by grace. We're saved. We're children of God. But all of us have sinned. Every single person. Now, you might be one of those who like to categorize your sins. Well, your sins aren't so bad. It's like we've talked about so many times is you can't see your sins, but you can see mine. And mine are always worse than yours, right? Ours are never as bad as somebody else's. Ours are barely little sins. Well, you wouldn't even categorize them as sins. They're mistakes, Right? I messed up, but boy, they're sinners. Don't categorize sins. Sin is sin, and we're all sinners. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, let every mouth be stopped. Just stop talking about it. Stop arguing. Stop debating, and all of us become guilty before God. So let me just tell you some things about sin. Uh, the, the first thing about sin is the reality of it. That, that it is a, a condition. It is something we do or don't do. As a matter of fact, when we look at the definition of sin, let me just tell you some things about sin. It's anything that's contrary to the holy character or will of God. Now about that. 
Have you ever been perfectly in line with God's character? Keep in mind He's perfectly holy. Have you always been in line with His will? You've never done anything contrary to His will. Always been right on line with His will. Well, if you haven't, that's sin. It's anything done that is not consistent with God's uh, holiness or His will. That's sin. It's also this, anything not done that God requires of us is sin. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and, and doeth it not, it is sin. So there's things we do that are sin, and there's things we don't do that we're supposed to do that's sin. Now here's some words that describe sin. If you'd like to know some of these words, uh, there are things like disobedience. In Ephesians 5, 6, it talks about the children of disobedience. Rebell, rebelling against God's authority. Rebelling against God's word. Disobedience is sin. If you've disobeyed God. Iniquity, which is wrong behavior. It's wrong behavior. Uh, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Colossians 3, 5 through 9. There it talks about the, the sins of the flesh. When we let the flesh dictate what we do. Wrong behavior, iniquity. Uh, missing the mark, like this verse says, if you fall short of God's standard. You know, uh, it would be wonderful if I was the standard for your behavior, for your character, because you could point to me and say, ha, I'm better than him. But I'm not your standard. God is your standard. And God is perfect. And so if you've fallen short of him, of his perfection, guess what? You're a sinner. You have sinned. He is our standard, our model of, of how to live, of holiness. Uh, another word is transgression or lawlessness. You've overstepped the boundary of God's law. You've broken God's law. Another word is trespassing. You, it means that you have rather than done God's will, you've, uh, you've overstepped your bounds and done your will. You said, ah, that, it's, it's like Eve. It, it, God had this plan, but Eve had her own plan. Yep. She trespassed God's will. In other words, ungodliness. Just you're not, your behavior your life is not consistent with God's standard of righteousness. And then the one sin, and this is, this is unforgivable. This is unpardonable, this sin. Now I wonder what you're, what's running through your mind. I bet it's somebody's sin that you're thinking of. I bet you just immediately when I said, now here's a sin that's unpardonable. I bet you started thinking about a person and a sin they committed. I bet you did. Many of you, it is a sin of unbelief. It's a sin of unbelief. And, and, and those of you who don't believe, and that means a belief in Jesus as Savior and Lord and give your life to Him. And those of you who don't believe, you're already condemned, the Bible says. You're already condemned. You're not going to be one day. You are. You stand in condemnation. But anyway, that's the one sin. Unbelief, if you don't believe, You'll never be forgiven. So sin, let me just tell you this, is not relative to what you think it is. In our society, we're talking about, well, wait a minute. That might be sin for you, but it's not sin for me. Sin is not relative. It's not to what you want it to be. It's what God says it is. It's what His standard is. It's God. It's, it's not us. And so then... Let me talk to you about the origin of sin. Where in the world did it come from? Well, first of all, it came from Satan, who, who was an archangel. Uh, he was in heaven. Uh, he was a servant of God. And yet he was filled with the worst of all the sins. Now, what are you thinking about now when I said that? He was filled with the worst of all the sins. I wonder what went through your mind right now. Uh, again, all that worst sin. It's this. The worst sin is pride. The worst of all the sins is pride. 
In Proverbs, there are seven things listed that God hates. And the first one, number one on the list is pride. You'd be interested to see that list. I don't have time this morning to go into it. But you'd be interested in seeing the top seven. Of seeing the list of sins that God hates. You know that on that is this little thing called sowing discord among the brothers or among the church, among the Christians. Sowing discord is right there in the top seven. Huh. How about that? I wonder if when I said that he is guilty of the number one sin or one of the... I wonder how many thought about, huh, I bet he's sowing discord among the other angels. Well, he was filled with pride. He was filled with pride. It says that he said, I, in this in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And God said, yet you'll be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. The origin of sin is this. It's pride. You see Lucifer's fall or Satan, the devil, the sin of pride. And then in Genesis 3, uh, in, in Genesis 3, you'll see the fall of uh, Adam and Eve when it was all about uh, Satan convinced them rather than do God's will. It says, uh, Satan told them, well, your eyes will be opened. You eat this fruit. Uh, listen, Eve, God is just trying to keep you from being all you can be. God wants to keep you confined to this little garden, to this little place. Eve, there is a whole world out there. There's a whole world out there. If you just open your eyes and see, Eve, why shouldn't you be God? What, why do you think he should be God? Why can't you be God? Who made that rule? Did anybody ask you, Eve, if you wanted to be God or not? Why don't you be God? Yeah. Well, Eve said, well, you know, you got a point. And she said, uh, she looked and the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And so she ate, gave to Adam, he ate. Sin came into the world, disobedience to God. Pride is a terrible sin. It is the worst of all. It takes us on a journey of self and not God. It's all about us and not God. And so then, not only do we see the origin of sin, but we have a sinful nature. Now, I, I just want you to know this. You are born uh, a sinner. You sin because you're a sinner. In Psalm 51, it says, David is, is, is praying in his confession his repentance of his sin. He said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And then in um, Romans, Romans chapter 5, it says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all because all have sinned. Amen. We are sinners. We have uh, we, we have a, a sinful nature. We're born sinners. Everyone sins. Everyone. In our actions, our words, our thoughts, our motives, we're sinners. That's the reality of sin. Now, sometimes we make fun of sin. We laugh about it. We kind of take it lightly in many cases. But I want you to understand the results of sin. Here are the results of sin. Sin is serious. It has tragic results with eternal consequences. I want you to understand this. Do you realize that sin, when we sinned, when we brought this into the world, when we, here's basically what happened. We rebelled against God. We made this statement. We said we'd rather do it 
our way is his way. Our way rather than his way. We rebelled, we disobeyed, and when sin came into the world, it brought a curse upon this world. If you want to know why bad things happen, I can tell you. The answer is sin. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you suffer because of your particular sin. But I'm going to tell you that suffering is because of sin. Sin is the cause of the diseases in our world, the tragedies in our world, the abuse in our world, the guilt in our world, the brokenness in our world, the loneliness in our world, the hopelessness in our world, the shame in our world, the addictions in our world, and death in our world. Sin is responsible for all of those things. When sin came into the world, it brought death and it brought all of these things. And so when we talk about the tragedies and the horrible things that happen, sin is the cause. Amen. And so we should not take this lightly. We see the consequences, all these consequences I just read. And then there's this condemnation that people have. As I read the verse, uh, uh, so death passed upon all, for all have sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Do you understand that we are already, the Bible says that we're dead in trespasses and sins. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, because of your sinful nature, because of your sin, you have already a condemnation upon you. Because you have not believed, you have not trusted Christ as Savior, you're condemned. You're a dead man walking. That's what you are. You've heard that phrase? Where a prisoner's on death row for whatever crime he's, he has committed, he goes to a place in a prison called death row. And when his time of, of death comes, when it's time to execute him, and he's walking down the hallway, the other prisoners say, dead man walking. And that's what you are without Christ. You're a dead man walking. You're a dead woman walking. You, you already have the condemnation of death upon you. You really do. That's the consequences of sin. That's the condemnation of sin. And the bad thing about this is you're not just going to die and, and cease to exist. You'll be just as alive at death as you are right now. The only thing is you'll be in hell. Let me tell you something. It is an awful, horrible place. And it's as real as heaven. It's as real as sitting here in Bethel Baptist Church. It is a real place. And those, it was prepared, by the way, for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for you. God loves you, has a plan for your life, and here's what he did. He sent Jesus to die for your sins. It's not prepared for you, but you will go there in your unbelief, in your rejection. Death, the second death, the lake of fire, is where you will spend eternity separated from God in torment that we can't describe. We can't describe, and it's eternal. And by the way, let me tell you, when a believer sins... We suffer. We have unrest. We're miserable. We have guilt and shame. We lose our joy. David said, give me back my joy. I want the joy of my salvation. We have loss of our prayer life. We have loss of our testimony. Sin is devastating to Christians too. And so we see the reality of sin, the results of sin. But the good news is the Bible doesn't leave us there. There is a remedy. Amen? Amen. There's a remedy for sin. 
A remedy for sin and its consequences. A remedy for sin and its condemnation. A remedy for sin and the devastation that it, that it brings us. Now, there's one cure. One hope. There's only one. Only one. It's Jesus. He is a remedy. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now listen to what it says. He is a propitiation for our sins. Remember, He is the payment for our sins. Uh, God could not, because God is just, because God is holy, because God's nature is that He cannot lie. Sin must be paid for. It can't just be washed away for no reason or swept under the rug or say it's okay. Sin must be paid for. The wages of sin is death. And so God sent His Son, and this propitiation means that God is satisfied with the payment of Jesus for our sins. It means He will accept the sacrifice the payment of Jesus on our behalf as payment in full for our sins. His death covers our sins. And so it says then that He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, the believers only, but for the sins of the whole world. He died for every person God's not willing any would perish. He would have all to be saved. If you're here without Christ today, He has not designated you for hell. He wants you to be saved. And He's done everything He can. He sent His Son to die for your sins. We pray for you. We witness to you. We invite you to church. We want you to be saved. It's the only remedy for sin. Now, I know people don't like to talk about their sins. They don't want to talk about the consequences. They don't want to talk about the condemnation. But it's a reality. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. And there's terrible results. In our day-to-day -day lives, we see it all around us. And there's an eternal hell waiting for those who reject Christ. But there is a remedy. There is one remedy. His name is Jesus. There are not other ways. There's one way. There's not other names. There's one name. Jesus is the remedy. You know, He wants to save you. And you just need to get your, you, you need to get your pride out of the way. If you're afraid of what's going to happen, you need to get that out of the way. If you think God's going to ruin your life, you think really He's going to ruin your life. Read Genesis and the perfect place He had them in before they sinned. And then read Revelation and what He has prepared for you. And read John 10.10 10, where he says he's coming. You might have life and have it more abundantly. And then tell me he wants to ruin your life. You're afraid you're going to have to give up something or change your life. And it's going to ruin your life, really? You need to, by faith, trust Christ as Savior. And receive his forgiveness. Receive his salvation. Receive his life, abundant life, eternal life. And know what? living is all about Amen. in knowing Christ. You, you, get, you put away your pride and all your excuses. Oh my goodness. Look, if I can see through those excuses, you think God doesn't know those are excuses while well, you're putting things off? You're falling right into that trap of the devil when, because you know you need to be saved and you want to be saved, but you're just putting it off for the perfect time 
when this and this and this, when all the planets line up at the next eclipse or whatever it is, you're waiting for the perfect time and the devil has you. Because if you keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, you'll die and wake up in hell for all of eternity. Get those excuses out of the way. Get your pride out of the way. And come to Christ. We're all sinners. The results are horrible. But the remedy is wonderful. As a matter of fact, it's perfect. He not only forgives us our sins, he just gets rid of them. Yeah. All of them. All of them. Past, present, future. He gets rid of all of them. And he doesn't bring them up anymore. You're born into God's family. Come to Jesus. Accept him as Savior. Let's pray together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.